Good evening, brothers and sisters. Turn your Bibles, please. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 8. You know, we've been clicking this off one chapter at a time, and uh, there's only 12 chapters, and I don't know, maybe it'll be the shortest teaching I've done through a book in ever. That would mean 12 teachings, right? Uh, but anyway, we're going to be in chapter 8 tonight of Daniel, prophecy of Daniel. Again, we're going to see more of what Daniel has a vision of. He has a vision in prophecy. Excuse me. I got a lozenger in my mouth here. Anyway, um, we're going to see Daniel. He's going to have, he's, he speaks now. He records another vision he has. And it is, this vision also consists same much as the same as the other ones. In fact, they cover the same areas. Uh, the future in the rise and fall of empires, right? The fall of, rise and fall of empires in the ancient time. And we see he goes into the future uh, further, further on too, which is the fulfillment of something that hasn't come to play play yet, right? He's going to see a part of their prophecies in there. You know, Daniel's visions, like I say, they're the, they're, they're the same. He has this second vision, but it's the same, but it gives more detail. Uh, you know, near, a near vision of what's going to be taking place, a fall of a, a kingdom, Babylon. It goes further and further and further. These fulfillments, and each of these, by the way, did come to pass one, one is one that has not come to pass yet, and it's during the time of the Antichrist. And we're going to see that in that vision here that he has. You guys remember, uh, do we have that screen? Do we have that screen? Ah, you guys remember this, okay? Uh, this neat drawing I did here. And this being the eye of the prophet. And he sees, he looks, right? God gives him a vision. And he sees an event happen. And then later there's a bunch of time and there's another event happens. And we see that Daniel talks about these, or his visions are these different actual rise and falls of kingdom in, well, some after his time, obviously. But then many times you can see an event like this and then there's a time lapse and maybe even another event. And then this event repeats itself, right? Basically repeats itself. And that's what we're going to see this evening in our study. How the, one of these events, which has to do with the empire of Greece, how it actually repeats itself. So anyway, um, it's important to note. One thing important to note as we study here in the Old Testament, and much, many times in the New Testament also. These visions of Daniel that he has, right? These visions pertain to the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, do you understand? All right, they pertain. Now, obviously, the non-Jew and the Christian in our time, when it comes into the tribulation, well, we can be affected. The Gentiles can be affected, but these prophecies are towards the Jewish people and towards the Holy Land, towards Israel, towards Jerusalem. It's very important that we don't get it out of context and then say, well, it's for the church necessarily, right? We could be affected by these different visions or these different prophecies he gives, We as Christians have the luxury of being what God's word calls grafted into the tree of the Jews. Okay? We're grafted into that tree, into God's tree. The Jews belong. They are the limbs that were established in the beginning, right? With the root of the tree and the tree being God. And they, I turn to Romans chapter 11, if you could, please. Roman chapter 11, and Paul speaks of this very thing, how as Christians we were grafted in and the limbs of the Jewish people were broken off. But they can go back to the tree, and that's what will take place during the time of the tribulation for the Jews. If you go to Romans 11, let's read there real quick, beginning in verse 1. Paul says, I say then, 
Has God cast away his people, meaning the Jews? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite, he was a Jew, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. He says, hey, Apostle Paul, I was a Jew. Has he cast them away? Certainly not. He says, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew, or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah and how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But, he says, Paul says, but what does the divine response say to him? What does God say to, to uh, um, I'm sorry, to, to I, uh, Isaiah, Elijah, I'm sorry, Elijah. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself, God says, 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace, Paul says. This, this remnant, and God always has a remnant, by the way, and, which means a group of people, a remnant. And if by grace... Uh, if by grace, then, it is no longer works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is works, it is no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it. Basically, those Christians coming in have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Well, it says the elect, though, there were a lot of Jews that believed in Jesus, too. Amen? And you see today mess, what they call messianic Jews. They still do a lot of the tradition of the Jewish religion, but they are messianic, meaning they believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. In fact, there's several messianic Jew churches in Prescott, I believe. Um, several up there. And he says... Uh, what then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, even that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, to this very day. And David said, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let the eyes be darkened so that they uh, do not see and bow down their back always. In verse 11, Paul continues on. He says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fail? Certainly not, okay? God will always, he loves his people, and those are the Jewish people. He will continue to work with them. And he says, certainly not, but though uh, through their fail to provoke them to jealousy, uh, salvation now has come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, right? Salvation now came to the Gentiles, that these Jews would be jealous, right? They got a connection with God. Now, if, they, if their fall is, uh, I'm sorry, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the gentiles how much more their fullness in other words god's amazing you know he's he's the orchestrator of all of this he says how much more their fullness for i speak to you gentiles in as much as i am an apostle to the gentiles he was preaching to the Gentiles, Paul was, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I am provoked to jealousy those who are uh, my flesh and save some of them. He says, those who are fellow Jews is what he's saying. My flesh, right? If I could save some of them. For if they're being cast away in the, in the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be? But life from, dead, from the dead. For if the first, born, uh, first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy, and the root is holy, and so are the branches. And if some of the branches, he means the branches being the Jewish people, and if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, speaking of the Christians, were grafted in among them, with them, became a partaker of the root. Now, we became a partaker of God's tree, the root of God. He says... Uh, you, you were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches, he says. Don't boast against them. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Amen. You haven't supplanted 
Israel. We have not. So many churches. There's churches that believe that the church surplanted Israel, that we are now God's chosen people. We're saved. Amen. We're saved. But God's chosen people is still the Jews and always will be. He says, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in, right? You better, if you know what grafting is, a tree, you actually take and notch that tree to the center, you take a limb and you put it in there and you, and that limb will go, will grow off that tree. Anyway, that you were grafted in. Well said, because of the belief that they were broken off and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, right? Broke those ones off. He may not spare you either. <laughs> uh, therefore, he says, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fail severity, severely. But toward you goodness, and if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. Those are those Jews that have come to a relationship with Jesus, the Messianic Jews. And Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago, guys. And it's still taking place. They'll be grafted back in. For if they were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild uh, by nature, and were grafted contrary to the nature into the cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? They belong there. They belong in that tree of God. He says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Right? And it truly is. It's a mystery. Why are the Jews blinded? It says, the Bible says they got scales over their eyes. I don't want you to be blind of this mystery, right? Or ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be uh, wise in your own opinion. But blindness in part has happened to Israel until the, what? The fullness of the Gentiles has come in. You ever think about that? What is the fullness of the Gentiles? Till that one, who, whatever the number is, that one receives Jesus. And then, boom, comes the rapture of the church. How important it is to reach out to people. Could you imagine if you were uh, uh, sharing the gospel with somebody and you're sharing with them and they said, I would like to receive Jesus and they tell you that and you lead them in a prayer and they receive Jesus and immediately were raptured? That was the fullness of the Gentile. <laughs> wow, I'd like to be that one. Amen. Anyway, we got to get going here. Let's pray. Mm. Father God, I just thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you that uh, your word is sound, your word is true, and Lord, we just want to look in your word tonight and see what you have for us, God. In the book of Daniel, Lord, bless the reading of your word, in Jesus' name, amen. I really wanted to make that, that point because <clears throat> the fact that, uh, you know, these visions Daniel sees, they mostly pertain to the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, who will go into the tribulation, guys. As Christians, I believe in pre-rapture, pre-tribulation, rapture of the church. Scriptures speak it. So anyway, the title of the message tonight is Near, Far, or Close, okay? And we're going to kind of see here what I mean by that. Near, Far, or Close. In verse 1 of chapter 8, Daniel, he writes, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me. To me, Daniel. He identifies himself. A vision appeared to me. To me, Daniel. After the one that appeared to me the first time. We read that in chapter 7. Right? We read the vision there. So this is the second one. And it's in the year, uh, the third year of King uh, Belshazzar. He says, I saw in the vision, and it so happened while I was looking, he says, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, the city of Shushan, right? Which is the, in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulai. Now, these are actual places. And he says, I have this vision. Now, Daniel refers, first off, in the timeline of, there again, King Belshazzar, right? Belshazzar. 
It's still in that time. He was the king of Babylon, right? So this hasn't taken place. You remember Darius came in in chapter 5 or somewhere in there. That hasn't taken place. He's referring back to this time when uh, Belshazzar was uh, still king in Babylon. And this is his second vision of the, in this time period. You know, this time, the vision, at the time of this vision, I want to say Babylon was very secure in their power. They were the power of the world, right? They owned the world. And, and Daniel is going to see in, again in a vision when the time to the future, when that portion, that Babylon and their power is going to cease and obviously another king come in. Now, in verse 2, he says he was in, he was in uh, Daniel was in Shushan, right? Now, if you went all the way to the end of, uh, of chapter 8, you'll see why he was there. He was actually doing business for the king, for King Belshazzar. Daniel had a very, very high position as an official. Even though he was a captive, right? He was like one of the captives there. He was a very high governor position. And so he would send him out on journeys across Babylon, different cities and things of that nature. One word about Daniel. You know, you think, oh, maybe he'll go escape. No, not Daniel. And so this is where he's at. We're going to read that in the very end of the chapter, why he was there. But anyway, go on to verse 3 as we move on. And then he said, he said, uh, then I lifted my eyes. So he's there. He has it having this vision. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram, right? You know what a ram is, right? Big male sheep, I guess you'd call it. Um, but a ram which had, uh, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. So one horn was a little taller than the other. And the higher one came up last, actually, okay? And he says, I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward so that no animal could withstand him nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did, he did according to his will and became great. Now, if you remember before, uh, his visions had animals in it, right, and representations there. Uh, the ram, go to verse 20. This ram is clearly identified as Daniel gets an interpretation. If you go to verse 20 in chapter 8, it says, The ram which you saw, we'll get there later, but I want to point this out. We know what this ram is because it says in chapter 20, The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media, Media and Persia. Okay, The Media Persia uh, kingdoms. So there's two horns there, and we know that Darius, the Media Persians, capture Babylon, take over at first. So that it is the Median Persian Empire. This ram, by the way, was always a symbol of the Medes and the Persians. The, the ram, the, the headdress of the leaders would be a ram and ram horns. Okay, And so it makes perfect sense why he's seeing ram. In fact, the coins they had stamped was with a ram on it and the big horns. And so this is what he's seeing here is that. Go on to verse Four, if you would please. Go back to verse 4. And he said, I saw a ram now is pushing westward, northward, southward, so that no animal could withstand him, right? So it's pushing north and south and west. Well, in history, it is shown with the Median Persian Empire, their direction of, con of conquest with that empire was to the north of them, was to the south of them, was to the west of them. They did not push east. They did not go east. And so it's interesting because history lines up with this perfectly, guys. You know, I almost want to say, you know, the Bible has so much history in it, you know. Is it a history book? Yeah. You know, some people say, well, is it a science book? Yeah. Actually, it does. It has a lot of science. Go into Genesis. Talk, talks about science, eh, man? Anyway, let's go on to verse 5. We need to move on. And he says, and as I was considering, he's thinking about this ram, he says, and as I was considering, suddenly a male goat 
came from the west, across the surface of the whole earth, without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So he's got one horn, one horn, flying pooper, people eater. That's what he was. That's where the guy got the song, I think, from this goat, you know, because he was flying. <laughs> no. What was that on, Saturday Night Live? What was that at? One-eyed, one-horned, flying purple people eater. Right? I don't know. Anyway, that's an old song. I don't know where it came from. And I just got off track here. Where, where are we? Verse 5. And he says, across the surface of the whole earth, without touching the ground. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which had seen a which he had seen standing beside the river and ran at him with a furious power. And I saw him uh, confronting the ram, this goat. And he was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, broke off his horns. But he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore, the male goat grew very great. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken off. Now, he's got that goat with a big old horn. The large horn was broken, and in its place were four notable ones that came up toward the four winds of heaven. Amazing, right? And we've heard this before. We've seen this in a different image, a different vision, in his vision in chapter 7. But this male goat, there we go, go to verse 21 now. It's clearly identified as the Grecian Empire in 21. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is in between its eyes is the first king. So this large horn is, or it's identified as Greece, and this one horned goat. Again, this was a symbol of Greece, was the goat, right? Uh, they called him the people of the goat, right? They were goat. What is goat today? You say, well, he's a real goat. Uh, what does that stand for? Uh, greatest what? Greatest of all time. Greatest of all time, right? Well, they were the greatest of all time because they kicked the, you know what, of the Medo-Persian Empire, and they came where, he says, from the west in his vision. That's where they came from. So historically, that's what they did. And they rose suddenly. This ruler of the one horn, and I mentioned it a couple weeks ago in the teaching, was Alexander the Great. He was 28 years old, and he conquered the world. Literally, that's how quick they rose so fast, going across the ground, not touching the ground, basically, is what Daniel sees. But at his death, Alexander the Great, his kingdom was divided. He didn't divide it, okay? These four generals divided it between themselves. They were of his military, and they divided and said, hey, we're all going to take a portion here. In verse 8, you see there, it says, Therefore the male goat grew very great, Alexander the Great, but when he became strong, and very strong, the large horn was broken, and in his place he was dead, all right? He ended up dying, Alexander the Great. And so it was broken off. So the power is divided between these four generals. And I brought this out a couple weeks ago. And uh, there was Cassander. He, wrote, he was ruling over Greece and its region. There was Lysimachus ruling over the Asia Minor part. There was Seleucus ruling over Syria and Israel's land, Jerusalem. And there was Ptolemy ruling over Egypt. So they divided up Alexander the Great into these four areas. Now, I want to make a note here, very important note, okay? The horn, right? We keep reading about horns. The horn in the Bible always gives a symbol of power. The horn in Scripture means power. Take, for instance, in Psalm 18.2, it'll be on the screen. David writes, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn, the power of my salvation. Horn always represent, represents power. If you remember when we were studying whatever, Leviticus or something like that, and there were the horns that was on the, uh, the altar, right? 
And those horns meant power also. The horn of my salvation, my stronghold. In Psalm 75, 10, it says, all the horns of the wicked will also be cut off. All the power of the wicked will be cut off, as it says in Psalms, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. But the power of the righteous. So always remember, when you see horn in the Bible, it's speaking about the power, right? And of course, God's power, the greatest of the horns, right? As far as that goes. Mm. Move on to verse 9 here. <sighs> Where am I? Chapter 8, verse 9. Okay. And out of one of them then, these horns, right? These four. And out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south towards the east, and towards the glorious land. When it says the glorious land, it means Jerusalem. That's Jerusalem area. And so it grew this way. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, God. Okay? the prince of the host of God. And, and, by, and by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgressions, an army was given over to the horn to oppose, uh, oppose the daily sacrifices. The power was given to this horn. I'm going to tell you who this was back in history and still yet to come. Was given to this horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground, and he and did all this and prospered, it says there. So Daniel has this vision. It continues on. Now Daniel's vision here, I want to tell you right here, and then we'll continue it on. It's actually speaking of two time periods. You remember on the screen? Here's a time period event here, and the same event basically up here. It's speaking of two different time periods. One far out, the Grecian Empire, okay, and what takes place there, and then one much further out, but close to us, right? You wonder where I got the title, near, far, or close, right? It's closer to us, this event he's speaking about here. Now, first off, who is this little horn, right? The little horn came up. The little horn came up out of there. His name was Antichus Epiphanes. Antichus Epiphanes. Antichus? Antichrist. Sounds familiar, don't it? Antichus Epiphanes. Now, the second one is the Antichrist to come. Okay, there's two events we're going to be looking at. And they actually, the one has in history taken place, that of Antichus Epiphanes, but then the Antichrist to come. You know, the similarity between Antichus Epiphanes and the Antichrist in scriptures can only be thought of as what you call, what you call a type, okay? Antichus Epiphanes was a type of Antichrist within the Bible. Okay, and so it's amazing because the, the, the scripture that we read about the Antichrist and the scripture we read about him are basically in a line. Now, Antichus Epiphanes exerted his dominion, and as it was we were reading there, towards the south, towards the east, and towards the land of Israel. Antichus Epiphanes murdered other rulers and persecuted the people of Israel. He cast, it says, he cast down some of the host, and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. Antichus Epiphanes blasphemed God and commanded idolatrous worship directed towards himself. What does the Antichrist do? Worship him. Exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, as he says here in this. Same with the Antichrist. Antichus Epiphanes put a stop to the temple sacrifices in Jerusalem. Um, and there it said, by him, the daily sacrifices were taken away. What does the Antichrist do? The same. 
It says, Antiochus Epiphanes desecrated the temple. The place of his sanctuary was cast down, as he says here. He desecrated. He took pig's blood and desecrated the temple, the, the inside, the holy of holies. And they had no more sacrifices in there. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes opposed God and seemed, uh, and seemed to prosper, it says. Yeah, he seemed to prosper a lot. He cast down truth, down to the ground. He did all this, and it says, and prospered. And this is what Daniel is seeing here. By the way, this is hundreds of years after Daniel died. Okay, it wasn't during his time period. He's seeing this prophecy ahead. And of course, as we look, we're going to see all the way to what you call the end of times. Daniel was around in 600 B.C., all right? So that's over 2,600 years, 2,700 years, and we don't know how close we're getting to the tribulation and the rise of the Antichrist. Prophecy of the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians, rhymes up with Antichrist Epiphanes, too. Chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one deceive you, Paul writes, by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, which is the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that he is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple. This was Antichrist Epiphanes. He was a type. Uh, in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, uh, if you like, turn to Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to read a little more about the Antichrist and how he lines up with this vision Daniel has. In chapter 13, if you would, please. Guys, people say, oh, the Bible's not true. Some man just wrote this. He put this together. You cannot put all this together, okay, period. Historically, you cannot put it together. It is the divine word of God, inspired word of God. Chapter 13, he says, then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast. This is, this is uh, John, right? John and Jesus has given him these, this vision. And then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. The beast, guys, is the Antichrist. When you look in Revelation, the beast is the Antichrist. Rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. We'll get into that later, because one of his visions, he actually speaks this way, right? Having seven heads and ten horns, and on the horns ten crowns, and on the heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. Remember? Last time in the, in the teaching, we had the bear, we had the leopard, we had, right? The lion, I mean, the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. The, and the dragon gave him his power. The dragon is Satan. When you look at Scripture in Revelation, the dragon is Satan. So the beast is given the power, which is the Antichrist, by Satan. Gave him his power and his throne and a great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if he had been mortally wounded and his, uh, and his deadly wound was healed. That's one thing about the Antichrist. He said, they say it actually, he will suffer a mortal head wound and then come back to life. Sounds like he's trying to be Jesus, huh? That's what it is. Yeah, it's called the evil triune, right? There's Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Anyway, so he says, so, uh, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to beasts. They worshiped Satan, and that's what takes place. And that's what was taking place back with Antichrist Epiphanes, too. They worshiped Satan. They worshiped uh, the who gave the authority of the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened, where was I going in that? All the way to verse 9. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemies against God to blasphemies his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in the heaven. 
It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and the authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose name have not been written in the book of life. <laughs> Important that your name's in the book of life, right? Book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, John writes here, if anyone has an ear, let him hear, right? Well, all you got to do is go back here into Daniel, and the ear was, you know, it was already revealed. So anyway, Antichus, Antichrist, right? Antichus Epiphanes. Go on to verse 13, if you would, please. And then Daniel says, I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one, so he's listening to obviously holy angels, uh, those things of God, holy one, and speaking to another holy one, and said to the certain one who was speaking, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgressions of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So, number one, Daniel heard this. He didn't ask the question, okay, one asked the other, but he heard this. And then they spoke. Now, some will say, Bible scholars will say that one of these, you guys know, and I've mentioned it before, a Christophany, okay, Jesus was from the beginning. Jesus, you know, was from the beginning. Father, Son, Holy Spirit from the beginning. Christophany is the appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. That's what it is. And we see many Christophanies where Jesus was there. So some people say that Jesus was one of these who was the Holy One speaking. Whatever there. But in verse 14, it speaks of a time. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now, there's a lot of debate there. There's a debate on these days. You basically take these 2,300 days, and it's right near, especially in the Jewish calendar, right near seven years. Now, we know tribulation of seven years, right? And it says that the, these, uh, um, there's a debate about these 2,300, year, 2,300 days because we know, okay, if this is a type with the Antichrist, we know he comes into power at three and a half years into the tribulation, defiles the temple, and for another three and a half years. So now there's only 1,150 days. So as scholars have looked at this, number one, you had to look at a Jewish day. A Jewish day was from sunup to sundown. That was the day. And then when they did sacrifices, they did them twice a day, which would mean you're actually doing two times a day sacrifice. You'd have like 1,150, which would be the three and a half years back to there. There again, it's a dual prophecy. It's not only of Antichus Epiphanes, but it goes all the way into the end time. Now, Antichus Epiphanes, from the onset, and his destruction right, and taking over the temple, his was seven years. Okay, we're talking 2,300 days. He was seven years before the temple was cleansed. His persecution came upon him in 171 B.C. And so in 171 B.C., he came in and took over, and they couldn't do any more sacrifices in the temple. And then the temple was cleansed in, uh, believe it or not, by the Maccabees, in December 25th, December 25th, 165 B.C., that is a date we know. It's recorded in history. But so that was a seven-year period. <coughs> you know, but here we go. Go a little further with this. These 2,300 days, right, says right there. As most prophecies in Scripture, there are those, there's others that will abuse and cause confusion. And this is what came from religions today, okay? The passage, I'm going to read this, the passage that has been a favorite springboard for elaborate and fanciful prophetic interpretations. They interpreted it this way. 
A popular, and, uh, a popular and tragic interpretation of this passage, 2300, they took one year for every day. And William Miller used 2300 years, year days, he says, to calculate that Jesus would return in 1844. Right? Well, we know Jesus didn't return. 23 years after Cyrus, uh, we'll get into that prophecy later, after Cyrus issued the decree to rebuild the temple. His movement, this one, William Miller, if you know the name, William Miller, his movement ended up giving birth to the Seventh-day Adventist and also the Jehovah Witness with the 2,300 days turned into 2,300 years and several other movements, he says. And so, you see, you take prophecy. The Bible says there is one true interpretation. And it says, uh, with prophecies, it, it, it says it, it's not, it was given by God and not by man and to interpret it correctly. we got to move on. We're never going to make it. Now, just as in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel receives an interpretation now, right? Remember that a couple weeks ago. He received the interpretation of his vision. And I want you to know where it says time of the end, the end times, okay? As we read through here, 15, Whew. then it happened when I, Daniel, has seen the vision and was seeking the meaning that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the, the banks of the Uli who called and said, Gabriel, angel Gabriel, comes to him, right? Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. It's a dual prophecy. It refers to the time of the end. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and I stood me upright. And he said, look, I am, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the appointed time, the end shall be. <laughs> you see why Old Testament's so exciting? Old Testament conceals what New Testament reveals in Revelation. Oh, man. Like I say, dual prophecy. The event of Antichus Epiphanes, right? We speak about that, and then we relate to the event of the Antichrist. Like, like my title, Near, Far, or Close. Because for us, it's getting closer, amen? The time of the Antichrist. It says here, uh, I'll read this. Just as Antichus Epiphanes rose to power with force and intrigue, so will the Antichrist. As he persecuted the Jews, so will the Antichrist. As he stopped sacrifice and desecrated the temple, so will the Antichrist. As he seemed to be a complete success, so will the Antichrist. From what Antichus did to the Jews in the day, therefore, one may know the general pattern of what the Antichrist will do to them in the future. Go on to verse 20. Now, kind of backs it up again, okay? It says, the ram, which you saw, we read this earlier, the ram which you saw, the two horns, uh, they were the king of Mede and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. We talked about that. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king, which was Alexander the Great. And, and for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall rise, those generals, out of the nation but not with its power. And they didn't have the power of Alexander the Great. And so again, this fulfillment has already taken place. Now go into verse 23. Here's where it jumps forward again. Okay, It pertains to both of them, dual prophecy. He says, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Thoroughly his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself to uh, uh, 
uh, exalt himself in his heart. <coughs> Excuse me. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. Who's the prince of princes? Jesus. All right. He will rise against the dual prophecy, guys. But he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evening and morning which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, Gabriel tells him, for it refers to many days in the future. <laughs> I love this stuff. Ah, So in the latter time of this kingdom, both near and far, both of Greece, both of Antichrist, Epiphanes, and the Antichrist. Antichrist, Antichrist, how much they sound the same. The one was as such. History shows Antichrist, Epiphanes. The one was. One to come will be as that. It's a type. The sinister schemes, both, both uh, were known for smooth words, right? Antichrist, Epiphanes, that's how he got control the Antichrist is known for his smooth words. The mighty power, it says, they're not his own. Antichrist, Epiphanes, and the Antichrist are empowered by Satan. The power is not their own, you see. It comes through the evil one. Uh, oh, let's see, where am I at? By the way, that power of Satan, understand this, God allows it. Satan is not even in... People think, well, here's God and here's Satan. No. No. Satan's a created being, number one. He's an angel, right? Fallen angel. Satan is... Uh, my pastor, your son, always said, he's a little chihuahua on the leash of God. And God pulls on him and does what he wants. So he's given that. He's allowed to this to happen. Well, everything is allowed by God. The time we're in... Is established by God. That's so beautiful. He's sinister schemes, he says. Both are known, like I say, for these smooth words. Prosper and thrive. Both look to like total successes. Both of them will look that. But then God topples them both. They destroy mighty, holy people. Again, both persecuted God's people. Both will persecute the Jews. They're deceit and, uh, deceitful, and they look like they prosper. Both men were, are so deceitful, these ones. Total deception. In 2 Corinthians 2, 9, speaks about the Antichrist. The coming of the lawless one, as Paul writes, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, deceitful, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved, right? I love New Testament, how important that is. People get saved. He exalts himself, it says in there. That's one of the verses, he exalts himself. Antichus, Antichus. He used the name also, Theos Epiphanes. Theos Epiphanes, which means God manifested, right? The Antichrist, too. He will be claim himself to be God. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, who opposes and exalts himself, speaking of the Antichrist, above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Antichus Epiphanes, way back then. The rise against the prince of princes. He will rise against the prince of princes. Now, it says here, I read this, though Antichus Epiphanes hated the people of God and fought against them, it was because he really hated God. You see, that's reason against, against the Jews. The same will be true of the coming Antichrist, who will hate the Jews because he hates God. Now, it says he was broken, broken without human means. This one here, broken without human means. Antichus Epiphanes died of a disease. He got sick and died. No human hands. He didn't have a sword shoved through him or his head cut off. He died of a disease. The Antichrist will die without human means, destroyed by Jesus. Right? 
Jesus comes. There's no human means to it. Revelation 19.20 on the screen. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, the beast being the Antichrist, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the, of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Jesus did this, okay? By no human means. In verse 26, now he's told, seal up the vision, right? And the vision of the evening and morning which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. Both for Antichrist, Epiphanes, and of course, on into end times for the Antichrist, amen? Seal up the vision. For Daniel, it is a far, far, far distant fulfillment, Amen? He's 600 B.C. We're up here at 2480. It's a far, far fulfillment for us, guys. It's much closer. Do you understand? It's much closer. Jesus says, no one knows the time. No one knows the time. Closer than we might think, right? It's not sealed for us anymore either. He says, seal it up. For Daniel, it was sealed up. He's going to say, nobody understood it anyway. Not really. We have the word of God. There's no reason for us to know. Only thing we don't know is when Jesus is going to come for us. When the rapture of the church is going to take place. We know how long the tribulation is going to last. We know what's going to take place in the tribulation. All these things. We just don't know when Jesus is coming. But for us, it's much closer. Revelation 1.3. Jesus says, blessed is he who reads and and those who hear the words of this prophecy, this is in Revelation, blessed are you. You know, there are churches that won't, well, they won't touch Revelation. Oh, I can't teach Revelation, that's too scary. You know, they will not teach it. And it's like, no, you are blessed. You will be blessed if you read, if those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near, Jesus says. Revelations 22.10, and he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of the book, for the time is at hand. John, Jesus told Jesus, uh, told uh, John, don't seal the prophecies of this book. Here, Daniel, way back then, was told, seal it up, man. Whew. Go on to verse 27. We're going to end it. Oh, we're going to make it. <sighs> and I, Daniel, He's seen all this, guys. Could you imagine this vision? And I'm sure he, he's not understanding it all, but he's writing it all down. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days, he says. Afterwards, I arose and went from uh, about the king's business, where he was at, right? I told you. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it, right? Wow. As it was with the last vision, remember in chapter 7, I'm just going to look there real quick, the very last verse in chapter 7. He said in verse 28 there, this is the end of the account as for me, Daniel. My thoughts greatly troubled me and my countenance changed and I kept the matter in my heart. He was bothered by it, right? What he saw. It affected. Affected him just like in chapter 7 here in chapter 8 we see. He's sick, he faint, and he's sick for days, guys. He did not understand fully why. Probably asking God why, right? We might be the same. Now when things take place, we go, why, why? You know, God's plans and his ways are so much greater than our ways. We just have to trust in the Lord. One thing I want to bring out, though, is this affected Daniel? Are you affected by those who are going to go to hell? Do you know those who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord, Lord, and Savior? Does that make you faint? Does that make you sick? It should. Because... God gave us, Jesus gave us the gospel to reach those, to save them from the pit of hell, to save them from the tribulation. It's not going to be a good thing. God's plans and his ways, when we go why on things, well, let me tell you, Isaiah 55, 8. 
God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For the, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Man, you think about what the future holds and what has taken place in the past, and you're going, whoa, why, God? Like I can say, <clears throat> we only, I believe we only need to thank God for his ways, his thoughts, and the future. Right? I share this with the teenagers all the time. Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your word. Lord, uh, keep us strong in you. Lord, help us to reach others. Jesus, help us to bring others to you. Father, let this, let this affect us. Let us, what we know, it will take place, Lord. Help us be stewards of the gospel unto you. In Jesus' name, amen.